Good morning and welcome to Breakfast Central. We know that, of course, it's the day after the holiday. So everyone's returning to work and we are excited that you're returning to work. So we're not the only ones that are going to be working. <laughs> you know, like the proverbial saying says on, on social media, we don't catch you. <laughs> You know, Thank so we've you. Caught you guys uh, today on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us and starting your day with us. We have a number of stories to be looking at today. I would, of course, like to get your thoughts on them. I'm Olive Emodi. And I'm Joe Hanson. If you're one of those wondering why the sun is so hot here uh, on this part of Africa, the West in particular, well, you might also wonder what it's like in other parts of Africa. For instance, in South Sudan, the sun is so hot that they had to tell school children to stay back home. And uh, a video was equally circulating where people were frying eggs under just the sun. outside their homes under the sun, just with the frying pan. So it's really, really hot. Aside from the weather condition that we're discussing, we're also looking at the issue in Kaduna. It seems it's not going to go anytime soon. Everybody's talking about how the debt burden is actually on the head of uh, the current governor, Ubasani, and how he's going to deal with that. So there's a lot of... Uh, chaos back and forth, fingers being pointed, oh, you, you cost this, oh, there's also a case of you looted the treasury and so on. So it's an ongoing conversation. Indeed, it is. We're still going to be looking at the Kruger attacks as well and the aftermath of the Kruger attacks. What exactly is being done to prevent this from repeating itself again? The children, how has their mental health been prioritized? Two days of psychotherapy might not be enough to undo the damage that has been done in the number of days that they were with their captors. We're also going to be looking at exactly what the underlying details are. There have been speculations as to what happened. On the one hand, the military says that no ransom was paid, and that there are reports that uh, they did, some, they did uh, murder some of the, or kill some of the terrorists or the bandits who were involved in, killing, in uh, kidnapping these children. But there's another report I was reading in the newspaper, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, where someone did give an account, and I would similarly, uh, an alleged eyewitness report of, ransom being paid. So it's just a number of issues that seem shrouded in secrecy and causing concern for citizens. I can imagine that. And uh, most importantly, there's also the conversation around um, which way Nigeria. I mean, that was a good one yesterday, by the way. <laughs> uh, the, the April, the April one did, did indeed uh, hit home. Uh, a lot of people, I saw some comments on the social media space where people said, I almost fell for this. Imagine, I almost... You know, you know when people... You know. A number of people who said they almost <laughs> fell for the April Fool prank said it was the moment I got to electricity that they're like, nah, this has to be a prank. So we hope that our reality reflects one that... Our, and that our children have in Nigeria that when we say the things we went through, is almost unbelievable mm. to them because they have 24 hours spa. They don't have to be yeah. begging and praying that, oh, Father, I pray today that when I get home, there'll be light. Right? The kind of things that we pray for. And people talk about how we're one of the most religious people on the continent. People hold on to religion because the government has failed. So when you should be holding on to the government to do certain things, you're praying to God to help you, to help you ensure that there's light at home, to help you that there's, there's light for your, you, you know, praying to God that there's light for your business. Mm. Like, yes, God has done his own part by saying, let there be light. And then he has given you governments to be able to ensure that they make policies, enact policies, and put systems and structures in place. Use your, the money you are using to pay tax to be able to ensure that they give you a decent quality mm -hmm. of life. No, but you are pr play, praying for your health. And I understand praying for health in general. But oh, yeah. even access to basic health care, you are praying, oh, the doctor that I, I pray that I will get a doctor today. So it's just very... It's very heartbreaking to see the things that the number of things that we have to pray for. You, 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 you go, you're going to a topic that I think, Olive, we need to take out. Um, we need to segment. We need to segregate. We need to separate. I'm using all the English words, you know, <laughs> um, so we can discuss it properly. And I think you just gave me another idea, uh, which goes in line with what I think we should do: the issue of religion, religion. in politics. Mm or religion in the lives of Nigerians, where Nigerians will pray about anything everything. and everything, when the solution is just there. For instance, the roads to travel, interstate, are bad. What's the solution? The government simply needs to fix it. But Nigerians will say, oh, we're about to embark on this journey. Father Lord, let the road be good. 
How? But it's not the people that are praying that I blame. It is the mm. government that has refused to step up to its responsibility. That is not making everybody become overly religious. Put... And we will prioritize religious so highly. Of course, the constitution does provide for freedom of religion, and I respect that, and I respect that everyone can practice different religions. But will prayer fix the roads? That's one, right? Then there's another one, talking about the, the how much we value religion. So, some people have highlighted the case of the Binance executive that escaped. That the reason why he was kept in the uh, Department Office of the National Security Advisor, why he was kept there was because his rights were restricted. Mm -hmm. For th his freedom was to be yeah. restricted. So why was religion prioritized that it was so important for him to leave this place where he was kept to go and pray? That if that was not an issue, he wouldn't have escaped because no, that was the but, alibi but or that was the excuse Olive, that was used. But Olive, Yusef, Yusef, no, see, I know, see, that story. He gets, gets killed. Kill uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot, there's a lot around that story. So many contours around that moving to pray from there. You know, I tried to reenact that story in my head, and the thing I kept walking to my head was that he probably wore a regalia that covered his face. For them not to do the one. And then he took Okada, you know, to no, go straight. To... They took him straight to go and pray. It was from prayer that the man disappeared. That's what I'm saying. From prayer, now he climbed, he took Okada. And he was in connivance with someone else. This conversation, if we start, we will not finish. Of course. Dashin yes. joins us. Uh, she's uh, here to bring us the breakfast headlines. Dashin, what's good? Uh, I'm fine. Good morning. Uh, Joe, you really have a wild imagination. <laughs> you should be a director. You have, this is my new sign now for this week. <laughs> when you see me, that means you have caught me. They said I didn't, I didn't pronounce yeah. the Yoruba one very well. They were laughing at me on my, in my Instagram. Because oh, okay, so I was like, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, mm. They say, What did you say, Olive? So please, to my Yoruba brethren, I apologize for saying, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, You people should let me know the correct one. That's what do you, what do you think the role of religion, what, what do you think um, uh, religion plays or the role religion plays in politics here in Nigeria? What's your t uh, thought on that? Uh, well, uh, funny enough, I was actually thinking about this uh, at night because uh, I couldn't sleep uh, mm. because. Some neighbors of mine decided it was uh, the right time to hold a night vigil, you know, while people were sleeping. They decided to wake us up and, you know, they prayed for two hours, 30 minutes. So I had to go back to sleep after the prayers and all that. You know, uh, this is the reason, right? When it comes to religion, nobody, like Olive actually said, you know, uh, yes, everybody's religion should actually be respected and all that. But not when it affects every other person. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. yes, you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, or whoever it is that, you know, uh, you, you worship. But you should actually do it. It should be between you and your God. And if it, uh, you know, goes past that, if it goes to the extent of disturbing other people, then it should be a problem. And you talked about, you know, politics. Politicians, it's not today, even before I was born, they've always used religion to brainwash people. They've used religion over and over and over again. You know, a case in focus, the 2023 elections, when, you know, uh, okay, yeah, the, the, tra the tradition card was actually played, but also religion was played as well. Yeah. And it happens a lot in the North. They we say, oh, the it's our own. It's our religion. Do not uh, vote for this person who doesn't have the same belief as us because your lives, you know, might not be what it should be and everything. They just use it to brainwash a lot of people and it needs to stop. We are Nigerians, whether Igbo, Hausa, Yoruba, you know, Shekiri or whatever tribe. I think it's high time we start calling ourselves Nigerians. When they ask you, oh, where are you from? I'm from the north part of Nigeria. I'm Nigerian. Do you get it shouldn't be all about Hausa, Muslim, you know, because well, in most cases, it is actually a criteria for everything. What you're saying is true, Dashen, but I don't know if we're ever really going to get to the point where there isn't a uh, conversation about tribe. In Rwanda, yes, they've learned from the genocide. And as a, as a result of this, you cannot go to Rwanda and ask them, well, which part of Rwanda are you from? It's almost like it's, un, it's un, an unpardonable offense. As a, as a stranger, you know not to ask them, where are you from? Because they're all Rwandans. So I, I don't know how we're going to get there. It's a, it's a really long journey. No, but it's, a, it's actually we'll talking and about if this. you're going to get a job, but, they ask you what religion you are. Are you? Well, I mean, we'll continue this conversation another time. You know what? We'll, we'll have this. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll pick a Friday or something. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have to explore yeah, it further. Yeah, Dash, yeah. we want you to bring us breakfast headlines, but let's first share what our top stories this morning are. 
where we go with the top stories, analyzing labor parties, internal crisis and factional war. It's a big conversation we're looking to have today. And away from labor party, we're looking at Rivers Assembly threatening Fubara with impeachment. Of course, some have stood firmly behind him saying he cannot be impeached. Sad story, university lecturer killed, car stolen in Maiduguri. Our man will be joining us to give us an update on that story as well. And as is our tradition, we review the newspaper front pages this morning on Breakfast Central and you are allowed to call in as well. And don't forget, we'll look at what Nigerians are saying on the social media space. So do us a favor, stay with us here on Breakfast Central. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines. I'm Darshan Usman. Now we begin in West Africa where gunmen have abducted 10 students traveling along the Ereni axis of the east-west road in Ugeli North local government area of Delta State, Nigeria. However, the driver of the vehicle escaped unhurt. Now according to the Delta State Police Command Public Relations Officer Ed Dafe Bright, the police are on trial of the or on the trail of the abductors as no ransom have been demanded yet. The students were set to be returning from their school in Calabar, Cross River State on Friday night when they were abducted from the minibus they were traveling in. The Rivers chapter of the People's Democratic Party has told the 27 lawmakers of the assembly threatening to impeach Governor Siminalai Fubara that they lack the legitimacy to execute their threats. Now, on Saturday, the lawmakers said they will not hesitate to commence a fresh impeachment proceeding against the governor if he continues to allegedly violate the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended and the laws of the state. But PDP, in a statement signed by its publicity secretary, Sidney Barra, asked the lawmakers to stop disturbing the peace of the state and allow the court to determine their legitimacy. Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu will depart Abuja today for the Dakar, Senegal, to attend the inauguration of Senegal's President-elect Basiru Fai. Now, he will be accompanied by uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Yusuf Maitama Tugar, and other senior government officials. The President is expected to return to Nigeria after the conclusion of the inauguration. Now we move to South Africa, where the Electoral Commission of South Africa has upheld an objection against former President Jacob Zuma's candidature in the upcoming elections. The commission said it had notified Zuma's Nkonto with Sizwe party that he is not eligible to contest for a seat in Parliament. South Africa's constitution does not allow an individual convicted for more than a year to hold office. Now in July 2021, Zuma was suspended sentenced to 15 months in jail for contempt of court for refusing to testify before a judicial commission investigating corruption during his nearly decade-long presidency. He was, however, released from prison on medical parole after just two months to serve his sentence under house arrest. The Electoral Commission said Zuma has now until April 2nd to appeal against his ineligibility. And that's all for now. I'm Darshan Usman. It's now back to Joe and Olive. Thank you so much, Darshan Usman. And we'll bring to you more stories, no doubt. You can join Darshan at 9 a.m. West African time, where she brings to you news now. By the way, thank you so much for joining us. And um, tomorrow, try and put on blue at least so you can... Thank you so much, Joe. Maybe if you have blue, you can put on blue. So that we can be matching. So we can match our colors. Or you can decide to cut your hair so I you match decide. blue. I know she's tired. That's what she's like. <laughs> and thanks for staying with us here on Breakfast Central. Commercial transport operators in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, say the recent Easter holidays have not brought about a turnaround in business fortunes for transporters. They say the festive holidays witnessed low patronage by commuters and called on the government to come to their aid. Some of them spoke to New Central Television at the Jabi Motor Park located in the nation's capital. Idong Joseph reports. What used to be a busy area during festive periods, business at the Jabi Motor Park in Nigeria's capital is evidently having a slow day. As passengers who are able to afford the high cost of transportation wait for the buses on ground to be filled, 
Transporters in the area complained about low patronage. People are complaining that there's no money. And they have not eaten, they want to travel. Instead, they prefer to eat and to travel. There's no money. That, things are very tough on them as compared to other days. Like before, we used to carry from Metro Potaco in 2000. Now, from Metro Potaco, it's 30,500. I see everybody that can afford, can afford that kind of money. It's also boils down to the insecurity on our roads. The level of insecurity is very, very high. So people tend to stay in their home instead of going through the road or book a flight. If you watch very well, you'll see how the street is scanty. People prefer not to do Webby because Webby you can use two, six, ten thousand in sending things. Then they will, they, they, any of the company that is traveling will take it to the destination you want that way be to go to. Blaming the situation to the high cost of fuel and kidnapping on highways, they say operations are being negatively impacted. If it comes to my own field, fuel is the number one priority. It's something that will make us begin to have petroleum because if we have much of the fuel and the price is down, I don't think the price of traveling will be that much. Number one is to bring down the fuel price on the, uh, uh, which is the major uh, thing that we use for transportation. The government should look into it, but it's too little to eat. The, 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 the insecurity is the kidnapping on the road and the bad roads. Transporters at the Jabi Park are saying the removal of fuel subsidy has impacted negatively on their businesses. They say they are hoping for business to return back to the old times. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idong Joseph. Very tough one there. Um, transporters complaining about the increase in prices and everyone still wondering. Olive, um, it's a clear indication that we really are in tough times. We certainly are in tough times. I'm not, I don't um, use public transport. I use a private transport system. And even with that, I'm gauging how I move. If it's mm. not necessary, I'm not driving there. Because by the time I calculate how much I'm spending on fuel, like I, I, I'm sure I've mentioned to you earlier, I never let my tank get to half. Oh, yeah. Because my, I cannot in good conscience bring out the amount it will cost me to fill my car from, the, from empty to full. That's so the smart once it goes down a little, I top it up. Mm. I, once it goes down a little, because it, it's heartbreaking to see how much we're spending on petrol. It's very, very heartbreaking. And it, it, I mean, it, it's a no-brainer that, that uh, fares will increase because, yeah. of course, the petrol price has increased, and that would affect traveling. There are people who will no longer feel the need to make certain trips this period. Oh, this person is getting married. Ah, I for like go, but, but because of the state of things, instead of me to spend this uh, 30,000, I will send you 10,000 10, in your account. You don't want to take whole body. So it's really affecting everybody. It's affecting businesses, and I can empathize with uh, those in the transport business. But let's move away from having conversations about transport to talk about some really, really gory sad news. There was a gruesome murder of a lecturer in the Department of Physical and Health Education by unidentified assailants at the University of Maiduguri. The lecturer identified as Dr. Kamal Abdul Kader was gruesomely murdered in his office at the university campus on Sunday, the 31st of March, 2024. This sad incident has caused a lot of persons to wonder if the assailants will ever be brought to book and justice prevail. A man is on the ground in Borono State and joins us live. Welcome, Umaru Kirawa. Good morning, Umaru. Thank you very much for joining us. What updates do we know concerning the unfortunate murder of the lecturer in Maiduguri? Yes, good morning. Yes, please. Go well, ahead. for now, for now, um, based on our communication with the police PPRO uh, this morning, he said uh, so far eight suspects have been arrested with regard to the in relation to the killing of the university lecturer dr abdul Kadu. and um, he said that uh, the body of the deceased was taken to the university of Medigori teaching hospital for autopsy and um, the spokesperson of the police confirmed to me that uh, the police have taken all measures to ensure that investigation into the case are done and then they, they, they will even go beyond the investigation to provide solutions on how to address such kind of issues, particularly in the university and other parts of the, the state. And um, even the, univers the University of Nediburi, sorry, has issued a release yesterday um, calling on students, 
lecturers and the community to remain calm uh, that uh, the police and other authorities are in the picture of investigation and issues of such magnitude will be handled by the police. Uh, basically, for now, this is the update with regard to this. And most importantly, such kind of issues need to be addressed. Uh, the perpetrators need to be brought to book according to uh, locals because the, the issue seems to be um, taken, um, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe the situation. Uh, this is happening five months uh, after a similar incident happened at the Federal University of Technology in Mina in Niger State. Um, and uh, people are saying that such kind of issues need to be addressed so that it will not skyrocket and become something else. Uh, we are just... Um, recovering from insurgency, the Boko Haram issue, uh, which they are saying uh, Western education is forbidden. And uh, individuals are, are, are taking away academy, academicians one after the other. I think um, much needs to be done um, in addressing this issue and then, of course, uh, bringing perpetrators to book so, 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 so that um, such kind of issues will not be be happening again. And uh, most importantly, this calls for proactive measures from university authorities to take steps, particularly in terms of using technology and so on and so forth, to, to, to bring such kind of issues, um, to address the issue timely. All right. Um, I mean, Umaru Kirawa, you, you've, you've also uh, been able to tell us that eight suspects have been arrested and um, getting in touch with the police as well to find out uh, what the situation really is on ground. But if we take a look at this current uh, trend, because you've also mentioned a similar incident did take place in Niger State, and now here you are again, another one happening. Um, do you think that this is a call to action, especially for uh, security operatives, and not just dealing with uh, insurgencies who are uh, taking or kidnapping persons into... Uh, the forest and the bush, but now it's starting to look like they're coming closer home. We're looking at campuses now. Um, what's your thought on that? And is there any report that you've heard concerning beefing up security within that environment, especially the University of Maiduguri? Most certainly, these kind of issues are called for action issues. And um, it has already happened. But... Uh, Authorities need to step up, particularly for the University of Medjugorje, since the insurgency has happened. Uh, since the inception of the insurgency, the university has never closed down. And um, uh, I think um, much needs to be done. Although we know that the university is doing much in ensuring that uh, even access to the university, not everybody is given access because uh, you must show your ID cards before entering into the university. And if you are entering with vehicle, they will give you a card to enter into the university. When you are going out, you give out the card. So it's somewhat, um, uh, it's somehow unfortunate how some people will, or some people will be at the university and then all of a sudden the mother, a lecturer, and then going out scot free or anyway. The police are doing their job. We await the investigation of the police to give us an uh, update with regard to the happening of the incidents. Uh, but now we give them time to ensure that uh, they investigate the situation. But by and large, uh, such kind of issues need to be addressed. And most importantly, proactive measures, proactive steps need to be taken into consideration so that such kind of um, ugly scenario will not repeat itself. All right, and I think our final question would be, what's the mood like in Maiduguri? Uh, what are they saying? What are the people saying? Is there a mood of uh, fear? What, what are the people feeling? I, I don't know if you've been able to speak with them to sort of gauge their emotions. Well, based on my own um, discussion with people within Maiduguri, so far so good, there's nothing like there is nothing like fear but uh what uh, many many the the, the 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 million thousand questions on the lips of many 
um, people uh, living in Meduguri is how could this incidents happen um, while we have um, everything? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of questions on the lips of many people here in Borno with regard to the incident, but most importantly, what many people are advocating here is justice. Justice needs to be done to the family, justice needs to be done to the lecturer, justice needs to be done to the institution. And um, anyway, the, 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 the situation is, is actually so, something else. That right. needs Marco, to be uh, indeed it is something else, and we're hoping that we keep following up with the story, and as we get fresh updates, we'll have you back to update us here on Breakfast Central. Thank you very much. Take care of yourself and stay safe. Thank you. All right, we move from my degree to Rivers. Following the fresh impeachment threat issued by the River State Assembly against the River State Governor, Simnalai Kubara, the People's Democratic Party have responded, saying the Assembly lacks the legitimacy to execute their threat. The lawmakers had earlier said it will not hesitate to impeach the State Governor, Simnalai Kubara, if it becomes the last resort to uphold the Constitution. Now recall that 27 lawmakers had to be loyal to the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Nyeso Mwiki, have been uh, at loggerheads with Fubara since October last year, and the Amur Wule led assembly that uh, as attempted to impeach the governor. Well, meanwhile, the PDP, in a statement signed by its publicity secretary, Sidney Tambari Bara, asked the lawmakers to stop disturbing the peace of the state and allow the courts to determine their legitimacy, adding that the lawmakers should address their legitimate question in light of Section 109 of the Constitution of Nigeria, 1999, uh, as amended following the uh, defections from the PDP to all progressives Congress. Well, joining us now is uh, Collins Odu, former member of River State House of Assembly. Uh, Mr. Collins, uh, we look forward to have this conversation with you, and it's a delight to have you join us this morning. But first, we will be going for a short break, and when we do return, we'll go straight into this conversation. So do well to stay with us. Welcome back from the break. Now joining us is Collins Odu, former member of River State House of Assembly, to discuss uh, the conversation that we had um, uh, right before the break. We're looking at the impeachment of um, the now sitting governor, Governor Simnalai Fubara, which actually is in motion. But then again, the PDP has reacted that um, they do not have the right to indeed impeach the governor. Welcome to the program, Mr. Odu. Good morning, Nigeria. Good morning. All right, let's start off uh, this conversation very quickly. Let's take a look at the impeachment and notice. It seems like it's a season of impeachment, and that's exactly what we're seeing. We did see one take place in Edo State, uh, which, of course, the sitting would um, begin tomorrow, which is Wednesday, April the 3rd. That's got to do with the deputy governor. Uh, this time, we're also looking at River State, where the governor himself is actually in the focus. What's your take on this? Yeah. Good morning once again, Nigerians and viewers. Um, I would like to first of all correct one thing. And uh, there hasn't been any impeachment notice for now. What the River State House of Assembly did was to outline all the issues that the governor has been failing to fulfill. They had, a, they had an eight-man truce, and they have done theirs. And till this moment, the governor has rather um, employed attack dogs to be attacking both the Honorable Minister of the FCT and the House of Assembly rather than going into what he legitimately signed, what he responsibly signed. We expect uh, some level of integrity for him to completely adhere to what he has signed. You all know that um, the President intervened and there was a roadmap for them to achieve peace. The other side of um, the House of Assembly had done all their part, but the governor, instead of doing that, had employed watchdogs um, in the name of Elders Forum, these and that. The reason why I'm saying this is because there, were, there was a time when the case instituted by the Elders was struck out and there was no legal impediment that period, the governor would have used that window to execute the remaining part of the truce, but he rather decided not to do it. 
So, like I said, there hasn't been any impeachment notice yet, but they have rather stated the areas where they think that the governor is insincere in the peace process and therefore warned that they will soon commence. Okay. All right. Um, now it's clear. And thanks for setting the agenda very smoothly um, in line with uh, some of the news flash that we've seen in different quarters. Uh, impeachment notice, uh, not yet, eight-man committee set up. But you did mention in your speech that there are uh, some, uh, I, can't, I can't recall the words you used now, uh, but you alluded to them as uh, dogs in case. Who are these ones that you've said have been set up to indeed follow up what the governor is, or the governor set up to indeed follow up what's going on? Who are these people that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I, I want to state that most of those who you hear from time to time make comments about this um, peace settlement, they try to aggravate it. So those are the people I'm referring to. We all have decided to remain peaceful in order to bring back peace to River State. But you see them from time to time, um, they come and make statements that will make the other party to get angry. So those are the people I'm referring to. Okay. Uh, talk to us about, you know, what your standpoint is regarding the statement about the lawmakers not even having the power to be able to determine the, uh, to be able to impeach the governor because uh, the case of their legality is, you know, one that is yet to be determined. The, there is no atom of illegality in their stay in the House of Assembly. You see, first and foremost, the 27 lawmakers form quorum. So as they have formed quorum, I don't think that there existed any speaker from any angle because one, you must be elected to be a speaker. You can't be an impostor. The law does not recognize what has happened in the past. The law recognizes what is. And what is, is that they were never, their seats were never declared vacant. They moved from our party, the PDP, to the APC, stating various reasons. And these issues are subject to litigations right now. And it's so judicious for anybody to begin to allude to any allegation that they are this, they are that. As far as the law is concerned, these boys have done nothing. They are within the ambits of the law. Their operations are legal and we're in support of them. When you say we are in support of them, uh, who, who is the we you refer to? So reverse right. people, the reverse people line. So we voted them in and they are there. But except for those um, attack dogs, like I mentioned, every now and then they are sponsored to be on the radio, to be wherever they are. You see, it's, it, 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 the point is this. I, 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 I want to advise the governor to please desist from these things. There's a difference between the law and noisemakers. The law would definitely take its course. So no matter what anybody says, you cannot go to the House of Assembly there to go and obstruct them from carrying out their duties. I expect that as the governor is saddled with the responsibility of ruling the state, that he will decide within himself to have a peaceful reign. And this peace is even in his, in his interest. Because who is, who is the driver of this state? Who is the driver on, this, on the seat? He's the one. He should be the one to begin to look for peace. But here we are. Today, one man is talking and they talk from all sides of their mouth. Can you clarify to us what exactly, um, what agreement the governor has not kept up, kept up to? You've talked about how the lawmakers have kept up to their side of the agreement, but that the governor hasn't kept up to his side of the agreement. Um, at least I can remember one that is very, very important. You see, um, the issue, the, I can't remember the, the point, but I can't remember the number on the point, but it's that, that the one that has to do with the governor going to 
present the budget. I used the word present. I didn't say represent because he has never presented it. Use, I used the word present the budget for approval, ratification, and uh, 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 um, uh, for him to sign into law and begin to uh, uh, execute. But, but the, 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 the instances where, I mean, it was obvious, take for instance in the Vanguard newspaper of December 16, uh, 2023, it was made mention that the Rivers um, Fubara represented budget to the full house. Uh, so there's this case of he did not present the budget, he presented the budget, um, a case of, okay, there was a quorum, there are certain, uh, certain lawmakers who were not available, so the budget would not pass, and so on and so forth. Uh, it seems that there is something, there is something that we would like you to clarify to us this morning that the River State um, um, Assembly is holding on so closely to and the governor himself is not yielding. What is that thing? We would like to know. What is that thing that is indeed leading to these back and forth conversations and fight? Would you like to share to us? Oh, very well, very well. I think that's where the problem is. You see, like I told you, um, the purported presentation of the budget before, in, as a former member of the River State House, as a former, as a former lawmaker, for you to be a speaker, you must first remove the current speaker and then be voted by a two-third majority. You just don't come and claim to be a speaker. Um, right on the this here, I call him right on because he was former deputy speaker, not he was never a speaker. Went to the court to ask that he be declared speaker. And that order that was given to him, a part of the order, I, I want people to read it. A part of the order says, all that you have told us, if we turn out to find, or we find out that those things are lies, you will be liable to 40 million naira uh, levy or charge, if you lie to us. And obviously he lied to them. And based on that, the judge granted him that order, which he used, assuming the president did not intervene. By now, Edison should be heading to jail. All right. For hold on. on oath. Hold on. So you know, hold on saying, to that what I'm saying that he was never a speaker, and therefore the governor couldn't have presented a budget to him, knowing fully All right. that. Mr. Aldo, hold on to that thought. Would we need to go on a very quick break. When we come back, you'll pick up from where you left off. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. We're still looking at the drama going on in River State regarding the alleged plan by the members of the Assembly to uh, impeach the sitting governor, Simnalai Fubara, even though, yes, no impeachment notice has been served. We're talking about the details in two cases. And to, uh, joining us to analyze this is Mr. Collins Audrey. Good morning again, and thank you very much for staying tuned. Uh, before we went on the break, you were talking about, you were giving some key points as to, uh, you know, what went wrong. And I uh, would like you to pick up from there. You talked about how um, the certain person was never the speaker. Yes, I, I, I said he was never a speaker because um, I was the former member of the River State House of Assembly. And I know that before a speaker is removed and another one comes up, he will be impeached or he will resign. And then a two-third majority will vote the other person in. Eddie Sinehe had only three persons that were supporting him and couldn't have been a speaker. So he imposed himself and went to the court to get an order. Like I said, the order issued to him stated that if we discover that what you have told us is a lie, that you'll be liable to 40, 40 million naira. And by now, assuming the president did not intervene, he should have been heading to jail by now because he lied on oath. So that is where I said the governor didn't uh, need to present a budget to only four men. And as at the time when he presented that budget, the four men did not form quorum because, assuming, let's let assume and not concede to the fact that Edison declared their seat vacant. But for him to sit before declaring their seat vacant, 
he must form quorum. So therefore, that whole activity was a nullity. Let's say here, the sitting, the passing of budget, and everything did not form quorum, and so it was a nullity. So that makes us wonder, how is the governor currently now running the state? Because if the budget has not been passed, I mean, how is he running the state? There are also indications that uh, some of the lawmakers are, are saying he's running the state um, on a budget that's not made known to uh, you know, the members and so on and so forth. And then my second question, most importantly to you is, Mr. Odu, is it because of the speaker that has led to the fight between the governor and the FCT minister? Or is there more? Because, I mean, uh, we're in the eye of the public. Are we going to say that it's just a little rift? We, we've also heard from the FCT minister where he said he had, you know, purchased forms for everybody, including the uh, current governor. Uh, so he's expecting something back. Uh, we're asking because we think uh, there should be possibly more. Uh, it can't lead to a fight with the assembly if there's nothing more. So you just give us one instance, the speaker. Is there more? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, let me clear it out that um, I am even wondering, like you are wondering, why how the governor is running the state. Recall that I initially said that he is saddled with the responsibility of managing the state now. And from all indications, any matured man would decide to stomach everything and have a peaceful government. That is what leadership is all about. You don't, because one man said this, or the other man said that, you put your house in disarray. It means that you're not fit enough to be that to be in that position. Then on the other side, your second question is this: the um, House of Assembly members and the Honorable Minister, who is our leader. See, we have a team, and it is this team that brought in. Governor Fubara, you will recall that some of his commissioners resigned because he was deviating from the collective goal of that group. As I speak with you now, Governor Fubara is hobnobbing with those who voted against him. I don't know the rationale behind, and the, 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 the uh, sometimes we look at first. This attitude or this, uh, this thing I want to do, how rational is it? And how moral is it? These are people who never wanted him, who made all manner of statements. I do not want to go into um, what I condemn as using wrong languages. But I, I am telling you that the governor began to do those things that the group, that will be to the detriment of the group. and. That is why the House of Assembly decided to say, no, we stand by our leader to say, this is how we want this thing to be. It is this group that brought you in. At least you try and grow the group than to dismantle the group. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Otto, talk to us about those who say that if the origin of this fight, if we go back to the issue, to the beginning of this disagreement, that the president, first of all, maybe he overstepped his boundaries and that what he did may have defied the rule of separation of powers where we would see that each arm of the government should have their responsibility and that the judiciary should have been left to settle this case of defection if the 24 members said that they were leaving the house that they were leaving their party to defect to another party the, the president cannot come back and say that okay now we're settling it uh, you can now return to the party because there's a constitutional provision for how that should be done when it comes to conflict resolution outside the court. So, can you hear me? I can hear yes, you. Go on, can. please. Go ahead. So, in the both parties and more of the governor beckoned on the president, taking a cue from what happened in Ondo State where he made peace. It does not mean that everybody in Ondo State liked what the president did. But they, taking a cue from that, invited the president to come and make the same truce in River State. And it baffles me 
why the governor will sit down and disrespect the president? My question, Mr. Audrey, is not, I don't think you, are, you got my question. My question is the role of the president in mediating in the case in River State. When these assembly members move from one party to another party, they defected. And there's a constitutional provision for how this should be handled. Is it safe to say that the president can override the constitution? No, I think you, you are expecting an answer from me, and therefore you don't want to uh, see my analogy. No, I I'm understand, saying... because we are running out of time, so we want you to sort of hit it, because we have to wrap okay, up the conversation. Okay, let me tell you, what the president did is legal. There's nothing wrong with conflict resolution outside the court, and it is a give and take thing. We, 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 you do this, this man does that, and, and, and peace reigns. So to answer you, the president did not go out of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Oh. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sure that there are many other areas to explore regarding this. And many people sure. will not agree with you. But uh, I know that this matter is still being decided. And I'm sure that we'll have more updates to that. Unfortunately, we can't continue with the conversation because we've run out of time. Uh, Mr. Collins. I wish you had enough time. Yeah, we, we, we'll have you back. We'll, we'll have certainly you back. have you back. Obviously, because we do know that an update will be... There'll, there'll be an update at least latest by next week, so we should be able to have you back soon. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. If you're just tuned in, this is Breakfast Central, where we discuss some of the biggest stories here in Nigeria. We've had one hour of delving into some of the stories. And now it's time for us to look at the front pages of the paper. Let's see what the top stories are saying. We're starting off with our first paper this morning, which is this Nigerian newspaper. The big story, troops neutralized terrorists in northwest region and to serve to illicit drugs in Ogun, says Ami. Suspected herdsmen kidnapped students in Delta. We'll come back to talk about that. Uh, Kuka faults distribution of palliatives by state lawmakers. It's no solution to current hardship, says Governor Diri. At the top of the paper, we have Red Sea attacks. Nigeria, other African countries to face higher inflation. Beyond London route, EPIs to hit New York before end of 2024, says Alan Unema. Edo PDP chair reveals traumatizing moments with kidnappers. Tension has renewed bloody cold war claims 13 in Anambra. The story there that, of course, there's so many stories that jump out at me, but the suspected headsman kidnapping students in Delta State in Ugeli, to be precise. Uh, that was quite a, a very, very uncomfortable story, a scary one, and a realization of what it has become and how uh, our students ha are no longer safe. We've seen a, a repeat of these kidnap inc um, incidences in different parts of the country, uh, we've seen we've seen uh, students in Kuriga. Thankfully, Kuriga was um, was have they've been returned back to their mm -hmm. parents. But the details surrounding the story is that it happened um, along East West Road. It was they were, the students were coming from Kalaba at the Erin uh, axis of the East West Road. According to a security source, the CNR conveyed a group of students coming from Kalaba in Cross River State was hijacked Friday night within the Erin axis, and the kidnappers are demanding a ransom of ten million naira. Ten million. Ten million. Uh, that's what they're asking for. That's like the, I, I mean, we don't mean to trivialize this story, but that's like the the barest we've seen. Ten million. Well, now. for me, it's just very insulting and disrespectful to us that kidnapping has now become a very thriving trade. SP Bright Edafi has confirmed that this is a real story and it's it's true. It says that they're on the trail. Now, if you recall, Lugeli, of course, has been in the, reason, in the news for the wrong reasons. Unfortunately, um, in the past few weeks, it's been in the news for the wrong reasons, talking about the Okwama um, community clashes and the murder of military officers and the uh, fear of reprisal attacks. They've been in the news for the wrong reasons. But this is an unfortunate incident. We'd like to open the phone lines. If you're watching and you'd like to contribute to this story, if you, you or someone, I mean, you, you have a family member or a friend who is, uh, or who was unfortunately kidnapped uh, in that Ugeli uh, situation, please call us and share with us what the updates are, if you've heard from the kidnappers. And if you'd like to react to any of the stories on the front pages, please do well to call and share your thoughts. But I think that what is reveals to us, first of all, kidnappers are, they are opportunists, right? They've seen that the quickest way to get the attention of the nation is to kidnap vulnerable people. So kidnap students, kidnap young people, so they go to school. Schools have become primary targets. 
It's also indicative of the fact that our roads are no longer safe. Mm. If you want to travel within Nigeria, if where you're going to doesn't cover air travel as much as possible, people would advise you to stay at home because there's no guarantee that you'll get there safely and come back safely without somebody hijacking your bus and asking your family members yeah. to pay. Kidnapping has become a very, very viable trade in Nigeria. How we're going to get out of this, I don't know. But we do have a pandemic on our hands that we need to nip in the board because if we don't, it's going to get worse. Sometime last year, we started hearing of them break, breaking into, or there were unconfirmed reports of kidnappers, not even unconfirmed. What am I saying? The, I forgot her name, uh, Na, Na, Nabiha, who yeah. was murdered. Yeah. Her parents, uh, they, they walked into their home in their estate and kidnapped them. So what I was going to say was that the points will come where they will start breaking into people's homes and kidnapping them from the comfort of your homes. Where your home that is supposed to be your safety and your sanctuary will no longer be safe anymore. So if we don't uh, re recognize that we have a crisis on our hands, that we have a pandemic, an insecurity pandemic on our hands, I don't know what, what else you know, is more glaring. You, you've spoken well. I think uh, you said um, what the president said. It's the same, it's in line. Uh, the president, his wife, um, the first lady, Senator um, Luremi Tinubu, uh, they both made this, a similar statement, which I think was, um, you know, came from the same pen and hand. Um, the wife said kidnappers are cowards because they, they go after the vulnerable in the society. The president said that um, kidnapping, um, those who engage in the act, will be treated as equally, terrorists. Yes, they'll be treated as terrorists. Um, he also went to the same line that they are. They are, they are coward, they prey on the vulnerable ones in the society, especially uh, students seeking the government's intervention and just to create chaos. And that's true. If you take a look at what we've seen in the past, um, let's say, this is, this is as far as we can imagine, it's so long a time that students are now the, the, the focus. But like you rightly said, it's also coming closer home. And that's exactly what we did when we spoke with Kira in the first hour, where... People are now being kidnapped. People are now being maimed um, just within the neighborhood. It's no longer a hidden agenda. But the, the saddest thing about this story on this Nigeria is that those who perpetrate the act walk away freely. It has been over 48 hours since the students in Kurawa were released. There is Kuriga. no... Kuriga, I beg your pardon. Kuriga, I beg your pardon once again. There is no statement... From the security operatives that the kidnappers who had kidnapped the 137 have been captured no trail no reports nothing and that's exactly what we're seeing today so it, it's a it's, it's a cause for worry and that's why the front page is there we will continue to see these stories uh, come up every now and then every day we're talking about it because that's exactly what we're going to see so it, it, it's, it's a cause for worry. I mean, it. still on the front page, the Edo PDP chair shared his traumatizing experience in the hand of kidnappers. There's so much that it does to you. It does to us as a nation, and it does to the individual. It breaks their safety. Imagine being in a den of kidnappers. I was reading, reading a report of some people who shared their experiences with kidnappers. Mm. There was someone who said, you know, who shared his experience of having been placed in between the two decomposing bodies of the other people who were kidnapped by him, who were kidnapped as well alongside him, and because they couldn't raise the ransom, they were killed. So because this man was in between the both bodies, even after he was released, he could naturally smell decomposing bodies. You know how you go into a place and you have a bad smell? Yeah. And even long after the Tell thing that caused that, that bad yeah. smell is taken away, mm. you can still smell it. Mm. And that's what happens. It's trauma, it's PTSD that people have to deal with. And Nigerians don't deserve that. Now, uh, still, yeah, go on, go on, go ahead. Go still ahead. on the front page, um, there's an update beyond London route, airpiece to hit New York before end of 2024, says Alan Oyema. I, I think, think, I think, I think the camera should come to us. Yes. And let's take our time to celebrate um, Mr. Oyema. If, if nobody would do that. No, thankfully, everybody has we, been celebrating we, we, him. We would do that. Well, and I think that other, the, other competing brands, their fares will start to do, have started to drop, right? I think that what Epis is doing is fantastic. I think we need to close. Um, yes, well we do. done. Yes, we well do. done. Because running a business in Nigeria is difficult enough. And then we understand how very expensive the price of um, aviation fuel is. And Nigerians in the most recent times have grown. You will see flights coming into Ooh. Nigeria looking rather empty.
because people weren't traveling as much anymore, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that it's, it's very important what he's doing, and I'm hoping that they're able to sustain it. I don't know how they're going to be able to make their money back. I, I'm hoping that you know Nigeria supports. Well, Oliver, Nigeria. Oliver, I, Oliver, I think I think it's business. One thing we need to know is that um, he has been a dogged business man. It's, uh, it, these are people you call serial. These are the true definition. Or the, this is the true definition of a serial entrepreneur. entrepreneur who is willing to go in without not looking at the risk, ready to stake all his claim, his assets, his plans, his strategy, and say, you know what, like they say on the streets of uh, worry or die and die. It's either we get this thing going because the beautiful thing about this is at the end of the tunnel, the light is not just there, but it's going to be even brighter. Now, people are already asking questions. This is one man, okay? Where is Air Nigeria? <laughs> it's, no, no, no. It's, there... it's, it's, it's something we need to really if you ask talk me, about. Who will I ask? We have a call we coming a call. in. Let's uh, take that call. Good morning, Chidi. Thank you very much for joining. Please go ahead with your comment. Uh, good morning. My name is Chidi from Atulu. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm calling concerning the Kariga abduction you people mentioned this morning. Okay. Because um, um, to me, I think the story is just funny and crazy because um, what we've been, I've been following up, I've been seeing the news where we were talking about the whole Kariga story, and then the next thing, the children are back, and then the next thing, I saw in news that they have met their family. Then is it that we, we don't get to see that part too, when they, they met their family, or is it that we don't get to see the part where the, the family gets interviewed. At least they speak. At least they tell us, okay, our child is back, you know, and this and that. Or is it that everything is fake? Because Nigeria seems to be a funny country. Oh, that's, okay. Those are very valid questions. questions. Asked we don't see the much. part where they you. met with the effort. Thanks for calling. Thank you very much for calling, uh, Chidi. I, I want to assume that the reason why we haven't heard a number of testimonials from the parents is because a number of these parents are afraid. I mean, their children have been exposed enough as is. As a parent, it's hard enough to expose your child. And, you know, for, for your child to be kidnapped and then you still want to put them out there. So maybe out of here, a number of these parents might not want to be able to expose their children. I, I want to assume that that's what it well, is. Well, I'm also going to add to what you said. Do recall that our man was on ground. Um, he did say that uh, there was, there was a, a, a chasm that was put between the reporters meeting with the parents. They, they said the security operatives did not allow them to have a one-on-one -on -one with the parents. They said, no, you can't talk to them. But in, in the modern-day journalism, the modern-day um, reporting or reportage, I mean, there are ways you can still carry out the interview. And I, I, I'm made to believe that he tried to make that known uh, to the security operatives. That, okay, listen, I'm not going to show the parents' face or their faces. They could actually turn their backs and then talk to us about their experience, how they were able to manage, go through everything, but they were still denied. I agree with you as well. We need to protect the families. But recall that the last information we got from a, a man when he joined us, he said he was expecting that there would have been checkpoints mounted within that area at a better radius so that it would show that security has been beefed up. Looking at the school, looking at the area, looking at the, the distance it took from when the students were picked up and taken to where they were actually taken to. In fact, there are so many layers to that Sadly, story. Sadly, he very... never saw, he said the, the checkpoint reduced from, he said it used to be how many? I can't remember, I uh, recall the, the numbers, number. I think yeah. 15, he said it dropped to about 10 or, or 9 or 8 I'm or not so. Quite sure of and in some areas where he thought it would be there, even within the school uh, facility, they weren't there. So, uh, we still have a lot. We still have a lot to do. Another dig. day, on another day, we'll talk to the governor, <clears throat> excuse me, about mm. the state of that school, the dilapidated state of that school. I don't know what, what that building was, but it certainly did not look anything like a school. Uh, anyway. But uh, we'll talk more about this later. We still have more papers to review. We'll go on a quick break. And when we come back, we'll take more papers. Please remember that we'll be waiting for your calls as well. We want, your, we want you to call in and share your thoughts on any of the stories. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us on Breakfast Central. Let's go straight to the next Paper, the front page of the Vanguard is where we're going to. Banks need 4.7 trillion naira to scale CBN's new capital hodl. 
there's been a long conversation about the uh, new CBN policies. No bank qualifies under new guidelines. ETI, Zenith Access First Bank, lead in eligible capital. It says seven qualify by adding retained earnings. No need to panic. ACAMB. Mm. Okay, uh, another one. Edo Guba, chairman group, bicker over a court party's candidate. <laughs> well, the elections is fast approaching, so uh, let's see if the bickering uh, can stop and uh, focus can actually be initiated. Police confirm robbers rob set ablaze passengers bus in Ogun State. Okay, all right. This is a. I think this was a, one of the transportation um, buses. It was um, um, conveying passengers and their their load, if you put it that way. And sadly, everything was burned down. And it's not far, just around here. We're talking about between Lagos and um, Ore. Okwama. How soldiers, villagers uh, died, eyewitness uh, gives his own account, says by also militant leader, the one known as Amagbe, not from Okwama, notes a leader from Okoloba, uh, led the army to Okwama, reveals the conspiracies, what transpired on March 14, allow Okwama to bury the dead, residents say. And there's this story that they're all in the bush, and they're calling on the president to indeed come to their aid so they could return back to their homes. Without salaries, we'll shut down varsities if, this is from non-teaching staff, they gave a one-week warning, <laughs> and then you had Sanu and Nasu, and um, now they're saying varsities will be shut down. London maiden flight, how we fought restriction of airpiece return flight to reject uh, to rejected part of MMIA Oyema says. He did give account on the trials, the travails he's going through to ensure that he puts Nigeria on the map to at least have a flight carrier, not just a local one, but also an international one. Let's look at another story very quickly. VP, that's Vice President Shatima, CBN Governor Kodoso, Ayo Teriba, headline 2024 Van Vanguard Economic Summit. And uh, LP crisis, Abure rejected Peter Obi's advice for all-inclusive convention. Obi Dati's spokesman. Um, hopefully he gets to join us here this morning, and uh, let's have that conversation again. Energy crisis, more troubles for Jenkos as federal government increases gas price by 11%. Olive, you know what this means. Mm. You know what this means. Um, there was an initial statement made by the federal government that the gas price will be reviewed downwards. And um, there was a stop uh, concerning the importation of gas so that Nigerians will not feel the burden as a result of the ongoing economic upheaval or crisis. So they could cushion the effect along with the sharing of palliatives there's also no need to export when internally as a country the crisis is killing its citizens and wow. this crisis we're talking about is the economic one so let's make it easy give them a soft landing let's not export let's make it affordable let's reduce the prices i beg to defer in that because i've not seen the price of gas come down since then since that statement was made, I still got for sixteen thousand five hundred. I did. That was, I did for sixteen. Something, 16, that, was, something well. that was sold for about eight thousand naira way back. So the point is, now it's gone eleven percent upwards, increasing the gas price. But we'll talk about this. It's it's a conversation that will continue. <laughs> we never never stop. Okay. On the front page there, you have um, um, a member of the uh, Your Weekend. Um, uh, you do have the First Lady there. That's all I can see. Uh, you can read up some more to find out what it is. But that's all we're taking on the front page of the Vanguard. Let's move on to our next paper as our time counts down. The Daily Independent is the next newspaper. Naira gains 660 Naira on $7 billion FX backlog clearance, BDC's return. Youths must align with government programs, vision, says Olurumi, Oluremi Tinumbu. Cardinal crisis, suspended APC women leader berates governor, reveals how Elvifai made him senator. As Senator Sherusani thanks Providence for vindicating him. Nigeria among 16 countries with high anemia rates in girls, according to UNICEF. Um, we also have Tinubu attend swearing in ceremony of Senegal's president-elect, um, president Fai. Global 
uh, finance awards. To, okay, moving on. How government set ablaze if it's in a cheap bus with 59 passengers? Transporters send SOS to federal government. This is a ridiculous, heart wrenching story. How? How have we gotten to the point where you can set ablaze a bus with 59 people inside? How? I don't have the details of this story yet. I don't know. I'm hoping that no lives were lost in this situation. Uh, we'll do more research on this story. As I, as I yesterday, they, they said there were no lives lost, just the goods. Um, but, um, of course, we're waiting for We have an update today. Yes, that is yes. no for we'll, real. We'll, we'll try and get an update as soon exactly. as possible. Exactly. That's really sad. PDP North Central moves to replace IU Damagom with substantive chair, insists on serving out its term. Obi takes one Nigeria message to Anita Mosque on Easter Day. At the top of the paper, Kogi gubernatorial elections, confusion as tribunal, uh, confusion at tribunal as more SDP witnesses disown depositions. Railway Corporation generated 1.07 billion naira from passengers in Q4 2023, according to NBS. Um, still looking at the front page, congratulations to uh, Jomai Fai, the president of Senegal. It's interesting to call him the president. He's no, lo no longer the president-elect. Um, the president of Senegal, congratulations to him. And uh, I'd like to read this story about Nigeria among 16 countries with high anemia rates in girls. I'd like to find out why exactly we have this I want to imagine that it's because um, period poverty is also very prevalent here. How a number of these girls don't even have enough, their parents don't have enough to take care of them. Where there is a high level of poverty, of course, iron deficiency, anemia will be rife. So this is, a, I, I want to imagine that this is exactly what it is and it's a no-brainer. But congratulations to us. With the Naira gaining 660 Naira on the uh, $7 billion FX backlog clearance. I want to see exactly. I, I, I think the question we should ask is, what point will the exchange rate get, get to before you say of a truth, this administration has done a great job? Joe? Hmm. I think it will be, um, if the dollar can get down to about uh, 450 Is it even possible? Do you even genuinely believe this thing you just said? <laughs> but you know I don't, right? Okay. But, I, but I, I will keep that hope alive uh, because if it can, then that means um, we're, we're, we're on the road to rebuilding very fast. But if it doesn't, our rebuilding process can continue, but it, it will be slow. It will be slow. I must commend um, the CBN. I mean, I haven't said this in the open. I think I have actually on this on breakfast. But I must also commend um, um, Yemika Doso for all he's doing, the CBN governor, because you could see there's a lot of, you know, I, whenever I see what the country is going through, like we all do, I, I tend to see him as, as an engineer who's trying to fix a very hefty machine. So he's plotting, he's fixing, he's screwing, he's unscrewing, he's putting oil, he's trying to ensure that the engine is working, he's checking the carburetor if there's any, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot. But then again, his works are indeed one that we can say is starting to take a roadmap. So Naira gained 660 on seven, um, $7 billion FX back. I'm checking current rates now. And, it's and looking at yeah. 1,322 today. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's what it is. That's what it is. And, and clearing that backlog is very key because the $7 billion backlog, you remember that the airfares were equally um, tied to that. were tied to that as well. And that has also been the reason for the airfares to, of course, have come down. Remember that a lot of them were already signaling that they may no longer do business in Nigeria. So, air peace has kicked off at the right time where this indeed has also happened. I'm hoping so, they can now revisit impressed. the conversation with the Emirates again mm. so that they can start considering going back to Dubai. And that, that stops. Uh, 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 anyway. This is your Dubai trip. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> We don't know. I don't it's know. It's not like that. I have the money to go to Dubai now. Yes. Let you, you should check the here. fare, by the way. Uh, uh, we don't have access to, to visa. Mm. That's anyway. true. I forgot. Oh, I thought they mentioned that we do have access. They've signed that was a lie. It was oh, a... It was what okay. I, that was oh, what I, I got. Yes. I Final that. paper. Let's just run quickly through the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper. Petrol subsidy removal. Ten months after federal government yet to roll out electric vehicles. <laughs> Energy crisis threatens project, charging stations inadequate in states. Is it not states that are far that we are? 
Let me not see what I want to see. Experts tax governors on infrastructure. 13 killed, two injured in Kogi also crash. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the bereaved. Mega looters won't go scot free, according to EFCC. Bandits abduct five day old baby mother in Kaduna. Eight arrested as Unimade lecturer stabbed to death in office. War on Gaza. Anti Netanyahu protests rock Israel. Netherlands stopped Niger topped Nigeria's export destination in Q4 2023. And the final story WK Damagom's fate uncertain as PDP holds National Executive Council. I, I can't wait for that National Executive Council to be held by PDP. It's going to be quite mm -hmm. different from the one we saw uh, from, uh, from the um, from Liberal Party where they had their own, you know, it, it, their own convention, so to say. Very little, tiny, but very few people, and then the fate of uh, Aburi was justified. But then again, we'll talk about that. I'm also interested in uh, that story that says, Ten months after, federal government yet to roll out electric vehicle. My question is not a question. It's actually a proposition. And it goes this way. If it's not ready, then don't present as it is ready. Olive, you recall when, um, when Labor um, Nigeria Labor Congress were about to embark on strike and the TUC? Mm -hmm. What happened was... Video started circulating of the 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 the, the CGN bosses, you know, reeled out by the government. I started to see we saw videos online where they were sprayed and there were comments that were ready to go. We started seeing people reverse the buses, drive the buses like yes, they're about to deploy these buses to states. Right. Well, we, we like to do a lot of premature announcements. So it was more of like a paparazzi. I want like, to read out the uh, the go ahead. Details on the story it says experts say productivity in workplaces has reduced, while the capital of many people whose businesses require moving around has been depleted. The federal government had planned to increase the percentage of electric vehicles in the country, in the country to 7.50 percent of the total vehicles uh, running on roads by 2025. The target implies that at least 7.50 percent of the estimated 11.8 million vehicles on Nigerian roads currently will be electric. I don't know how they're going to meet the target. You will drive your port. car. Your car will switch off on 10 million bridge. <laughs> you can't, where do maybe, you want to charge maybe it? Maybe they will charge a port on 10 million where? bridge. 10 million they bridge. Will, they will steal it. They will, hey, you don't believe it. You don't they believe will it. steal it. You don't, they will put, no, listen. They will mount security officers. I, I think it's high time we start being realist. If we're going to do things, we will start seeing that things are already being done correctly. If we really want to do it right. You see that, okay, and I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about other aspects. Olive. What? Our next guest is around the corner. And um, our, conversation, <laughs> our conversation will focus on Nigeria's uh, Labour Party, one that they call the third force. And when they talked about the third force, whether we were expect, expecting that well, the third force would have grown very strong. But it seems like the Goliath, as it is, is being pulled down by uh, a few uh, mechanisms here and there. Uh, trying to grab its attention. So far, so good. It came to the fore with a lot of, uh, you know, promises, presentations, and so on. But now... Things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. We'll look into this story deeply after this break. What many Nigerians consider to be the third force during the 2023 presidential election, the strong opposition party that will wrestle powers from the current ruling party, the Labour Party now seems to be going through tumultuous times from divisions within the party, which has seen the Apapa and Arabambi-led faction, down to the arrest and the release of Embattled Chairman Julius Abure, the tussle between the Nigeria Labour Congress, and so much more. The, part, uh, the party has also uh, seen its uh, members defects to another political party. Take, for instance, in Enugu, where numerous uh, also uh, members have actually made a move. There has been numerous attacks as well on its uh, office secretariat, accusations of misappropriation of funds, uh, just to mention some more. Yet, chieftains of the party believe strongly that all of these are mere distractions. The presidential candidate in the 2023 general elections, uh, Mr. Peter Obi, earlier on X, had hinted about moving from the party as perceived by many on a verified ex-space conversation where he said he will not die in Labour Party. 
Well, joining us this morning to look into the repeated challenges befalling the party is Dr. Inusa Salisu Tanko, Chief Spokesperson of the Dati Presidency. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you very much for having me. It's good. I mean, last week we were trying to have a conversation <laughs> online, but just like they say, technology okay, cannot be trusted. So <laughs> it's good to have you here live. Thank you. I, I think this is where we can go straight. Hopefully we can make do of the time that we have. So okay. we're starting off first. What's the problem with Labour Party? The obedience, Nigerians, they want to know what's going on. Now, um, right from the beginning, there have been issues. Let me choreograph the story in this way. I've been with the Labour Party, as of course some, many, many of you must have known, I was the chairman of the National Conscience Party. And at that time, we worked very closely with the Labour Party. So this is about 20, 25 years ago. And so consistently, the Labour Party has been the rallying point of the opposition. And so it's not by any mistake that you see that the, mid, the third force is being midwifed by the Labour Party. In fact, historically, it could even give you an entry that I know that even the emergence of Muhammad Buhari, disappointingly, one way or the other, was midwife at that particular secretariat of the Labour Party. Truly. And so while we are moving in trying to get the right platform, to champion our cause to emancipate Nigeria from the shackle of poverty and give good, good, good governance. There were issues within the Nigerian Labour Congress and then the leadership of the Labour Party. But somewhere around um, 2002, that particular problem that we had was actually put to rest through the concerted effort by, of Comrade Femi Falana and um, Professor Pato Tomi, Wale Okuni, some of us from a distance and all of that. So there was an agreement put together. We were just about to get into the uh, election period. Meanwhile, on the National Consultative Fund, we have been working very hard to get a vehicle. We almost got one for a merger, but unfortunately, time caught, us with, caught up with us. So now, this effort now produced the fruit that we have as the Labour Party. So we all announced after the agreement, and the agreement raised with the Labour Party and the National the Nigerian Labour Congress was two major issues. One, the inauguration of the Board of Trustees. Then a unity convention to usher in new leadership or to confirm those in position of power as the case may be. But the most important thing there is that there's going to be building of structures from the world to the local government, state, then the federal level. That agreement was domiciled in the dispute resolution department of the Independent Electoral Commission. So that was the reason why probably INEC having noticed that because those, that document was signed both by Julius Abue and Comrade Ayuba Waba. Signed. And it was actually assumed to have been a document, a legal document, and it was published. So those were the building blocks for the agreement. That look, we will do this so that we can build the party. But then, that particular document was kept in abeyance close to the election. So we continued. In Asaba, there was a, uh, there was a National Working Committee meeting. And that meeting, the, the TUC secretary was there. That's uh, Imao Gwaja. And then the, uh, no, uh, that's uh, Nuru Toro. And then Imao Gwaja for the NLC. So it's at that point that was, there was a kind of um, uh, elevation of one more year for that particular leadership. So expectedly, this year, it has actually expired. So we are supposed to have that unity convention that was agreed at the initial. But unfortunately, some the leaders of the party decided to do otherwise by having a national convention that was not inclusive, that was kept more or less that exclusively for certain few. Because uh, I saw in the guidelines that it said, if you are not two years in the leadership and paid, uh, you paid your dues. your dues, you will not vote and be voted for, as the case may be. And section 9, so section 1, 2, 3 of the Constitution talked about membership, procedures, obligations. Section 10 of that particular Constitution talked about the privileges of, uh, of members. And section 11 choreographed the structures that was positioned by the Nigerian Labor Congress. Unfortunately, they decided to start with the national convention from the national level. That 
kept a disagreement not kept. Right. But, but here is the catch. His Excellency Peter Gregory will be stand very firmly on the resolution of the Nigerian Labour Congress based on the fact that it will help in building the structure and everybody will benefit from it. That he gave advice. He advised the leadership that, look, have meetings with the Nigerian Labour Congress, have meetings with the National Assembly member, have meetings with the wider spectrum of the obedient members and stakeholders so that you can have an informed view so that you can make a decision on the processes you want to. That particular suggestion did not go down with probably the leadership and so they didn't adhere to it. And now we find ourselves in this particular situation. This and so many other issues that I cannot uh, uh, elucidate and amplify here were the bane of the challenges that we have in the party. But above all, if we can't trash all of this, I can bet you the Labour Party will be the strong force in this country and the third force will, of course, institutionalized leadership. Because keyword being if you can quash all these yes, issues. You, do you think that the Labour Party has uh, the ability to quash all, this, all these issues? Well, if you put aside greed and the fear of the unknown and believe that Section 9 of the Constitution says that you will treat all members equally and open up the space, we can surmount this particular problem. But as it is in politics, Interest is number one for whoever is in the position of power. Except, of course, that person sees that, okay, it is, there's no go area, then maybe he may have to become. But here, it's good to also give Barista Julius Abure, cut him some slack, because it was that ability to calm down that brought us to this particular level. Because at that meeting, had it been that he stood on the street and said, no, I'm going to go to court and all of that, we wouldn't have gotten here. But then I want to employ him to use that same strategy that he used to get the Labour Party to listen and act accordingly. Nobody is against anybody, but collectively we can be able to achieve what we want to achieve. There's yeah. enough for everybody. All right, let, let's talk about um, the embattled um, chairman, um, Julius Aguri himself. Mm. Uh, it seems like um, a section or a faction of the Labour Party does not want him there. And it's starting to look the same, especially for the NLC as well. Uh, we've seen the picketing that did take place, and so on. Is Julius Abure bigger than the Labour Party for not wanting to sit down and listen to the cries of its members to take or leave his seat? Obviously, no. If he was bigger than the Nigerian Labour Congress or all the parties, looking that way. If, if he was bigger, you wouldn't have all of these hues and cries. It's obviously not, and to the point at which you remember that uh, Barista Joe Ajiro, uh, Ajiro led a very high-level team to be at the secretary in defense of Julius Abure. So this accusation and counter-accusation is not true. He, I myself have been talking in defense of that particular issue because there was no issue of leadership. I've done it here. So what we are saying is that just let us do the right thing and it will usher in good things. He, he's not against any, he has the right to be contested if he wants to. There's nobody denying me that. Okay. Mm. Uh, let's talk about the role, the principal of the party, you know, or his perspective to all the drama that's going mm. on. Because according to a report by the Vanguard newspaper, uh, I'm going to read exactly what they have said. It says, if we can't change them, we'll leave Peter B. Speaks on Labour Party. And this is according to the March 30th issue of uh, uh, the Vanguard newspaper. And he went further to say that he, I mean, that he spoke about this doing an engagement with some of his followers on X, and that he said, and I'm going to quote what he wrote here, our engagement is about Nigeria. We are trying to change our focus. What we want to do is not about Labour Party. It is about what the obedience want to do about Nigeria. And then, you know, there, I mean, it's really a long line of things that were said, but the inference is that if the Labour Party doesn't put his act together, he will dump the party. Well, that, mean, that uh, particular engagement took place on parallel facts and experience. I was there too. And then he spoke to a lot of issues because um, he does this quarterly uh, space. All right? In fact, they were trying to even to hack that particular space for him not to <laughs> talk. But eventually he insisted and he spoke. And he spoke very well and he made it very clear. It's not as if that uh, we are in, he is interested in leaving. But you see, in politics, there are strategic moves that your opponent will do that will make life so miserable for you. And here I must warn some of our comrades. Yes, 
we ought to have mobilized members of the members of the Nigerian Labour Congress and all of them to have been into the party so that we will have been strong in all the bases because there's nowhere that the Nigerian Labour Congress and TUC are not uh, uh, represented. There are so much barrage of litigations. There are interest groups and the opposition too are interested in, make, in crippling the Labour Party because it has become a known thought force movement that is at the verge of taking over leadership. So what would they do? They will choreograph all of this just the way they did at the elections. They will choreograph them in such a way that when you miss this, it's like a booby trap. When you miss this, you will not miss this. You miss this, you cannot miss this. So it is important for us to sit back and if we are going to do it, because we sit down on the table and get all of these litigations, trash them out. The leadership issue will trash them out. Then we now put a roadmap of that particular Congress of Unity Congress that will take place nationwide. That way we may survive. Because these people who are against us, or against the Nigerian people, are well organized systematically in fraudulent ways and manipulative tendency, and they can use what we call humongous sum of money which we do not have. So right. that we need to be careful. We need to be careful, and that, but where that has become impossible, quite honestly, even if it's your home, that you know that your children are not allowing you to sleep every day, every night, you cannot eat food from your wife, and all. one day you take a leaf. Mm. Okay. So Let's, was, can can you speak basis, to the right? character and the leadership style of Julius Abure? And I, I'm going to link this to the protests, the NLC protests. There were reports, according to him, that the salaries that were meant to pay members of staff were carted away. And the uh, treasurer, one of, I think it's the uh, national treasurer, had come out to say that that claim cannot be true because they don't pay salaries by hand. So if he's saying that salaries were missing, he needs to come and explain exactly what he meant by I that. I think that statement was condescending. He ought not to have come out, considering the fact that most of us are working together and we know each other. We're just like a family. So it doesn't stop us from telling each other the truth when you are found wanting. Even myself, if I've done something wrong, I will apologize and say, okay, I'll go the right way. So, and, and, and I know His Excellency does that. It may amaze you to know. Sometimes when we are together, when we raise issues, and say, ah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That is the kind of quality of a person that he is. Some people say I'm even, even in love with him. It's not really to be me. What gets me is that when you can convince me based on, uh, you know, verifiable facts, and you can convince me on superior argument, I'm yours for the taking. Interesting. Let's, let's quickly touch on, let's quickly touch on, she was asking me about yeah, the character. Yes, please, I all want right, to right, wrap so up on that. The character, he is a goal getter, quite all right. He's a determined fellow. Because I remember when, we were, when I was national he was a, he was a secretary, a deputy secretary in Edo. But he was consistent in what he did. I've delivered a lecture on Julius Abure. I have. So you can speak up for his integrity? Yes, yes, I can speak in his interest. But you are all human beings. We can always we can make mistakes one with the other. But what I wouldn't support is this particular belief that we are the one that make this and so some other persons coming in are just trying to take up some of the things that we have done no all of us were in it even a madman on the street who believed in peter Obi has contributed in building that political party so he must be accorded with his due respect all right um let's talk about the national convention yes um all about the national convention very briefly though um is it an accepted national convention by all members? Or, because that national convention that upheld Julius Aburi as post chairman, is it agreeable? Is it, in, is it agreed by all members of the Labour Party that, okay, this is our national convention, or we agree, or, all right? Obviously, no. So what is the Labour Party? It may amaze you. I'm a director of publicity in the party. I was not informed. I'm seeing it for the first time. And even INEC, of course, has come out to dissociate itself from So what's the way forward? Yeah. You know, the problem was that, okay, probably you see other persons as, as uh, antagonistic and probably they are the ones coming in to come and take it. No, no, it's not fair. We all build this party together. No matter how little contribution, you must recognize that. 
All right. So what's the way forward regarding this? The way forward is for us to go back to that particular agreement of the Nigerian Labour Congress and the TUC, which is domiciled in INEC. It's a document already domiciled in INEC. And will this happen? Come again? Will this happen? Oh, it has to, if the parties want to survive. So, okay. so if, it if it doesn't, it will keep on lingering, lingering. And if you want to run for election, that will not be your best place for you to stay. Because at a point in time, you may think that you are coasting home to victory. Then last minute, somebody will just come and court, court order and boom. So, so are we, are we saying, so we're saying that the way the Labour Party is now, it is set up to fail in 2027. No, it, not if, a setup. If nothing changes. Yes, if it, it, not a, well, it's set up to fail, but rather it's set up to get to a greater height if the right thing is done. All right. Let me use that word. So, um, okay. I, are you also worried about the defections? We're seeing a lot of defections from the Labour Party. Those ones who are looking for opportunity, we, we ought to have been in government in any state. There's no doubt. But you see, politicians trust so much in an area where they find comfort. So I learned that the Enugu State Government has been able to take care of the labor people and all of them to a very uh, ridiculous level. So, and then you, you now have leadership that is embedded with a lot of problems. So you want to feel more comfortable with that being So they took that particular when the, the world has cracked. But not only so, and importantly, it's good I mentioned this, you lose some, you gain some. Well, um... You have more questions? Because I have another question. Okay, very quickly, because we already have my, my, my question to you would be, can you categorically state here that Peter Obi will remain in Labour Party? Come with me. When the writing is done. <laughs> and do you well, know for sure if he's running? <laughs> no, I'm not being vague. Yeah. Listen, let I me need, tell I need to... His best shot is the Labour Party. Okay. Because already he has sold it. Labour Party is his brand. And if he leaves the Labour Party? He's a, he's, a, he's a brand of his own. Can you imagine now shutting down 6 million of Azum and 6 million of allocated voters who are already given to you and then they are being shut out at the process? What is the future of the Labour Party if they don't do what, I mean, you've said that if they do what is right, Peter will be... If we, leader. not them, we, including you, myself. Great. Yeah. And if the Labour Party doesn't do what it needs to do and Peter will be leaves, is there any Labour Party left? Oh, well, you cannot say, but then definitely the momentum that we have We'll of course, we'll of course, visit that. All right. Mm. Thank you so much for joining mm. us. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for making our time to be with us physically. We hope to have you again. Thank you so very much. So we can much. look forward. And we wish the Labour Party all the best. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. And this is where we'll come to the end of today's broadcast. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again same time tomorrow, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. West African time. I am Olive M.O.D. And I'm Johansson. Apologies for not being able to bring to you what Nigerians are saying, but you could go to our social media platforms and you'll find it there. Until we come your way again tomorrow morning, bye-bye for now.